Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Fran Parathyris, and this is A Look in the Lab. Today, we are so happy to have Ira Rosenau, who is the president of Keystone Industries, joining me today for this discussion. Thank Thanks you so much. For, thank you great so much. You. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this discussion. So I just want to let everybody know that about a month ago, um, myself and two other members of the Zon Education team went over to Keystone Industries just to take a look around. And Ira and his team were so gracious, showing us all around this beautiful manufacturing plant um, over in New Jersey. And we were really in awe of it all, just to see the operations, just to see um, how you are innovating every day to see over 300 employees working in just that facility alone. Um, and I just wanna thank you for being such a gracious host and having us over um, to really get a peek inside so I could just tell everybody what it was like. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, you know, it's a very interesting facility aside from being a corporate headquarters, as you mentioned, it's a over 200,000 square foot chemical manufacturing facility where we make both dental and cosmetic products here. Um, so it's, it's just fascinating to watch how products actually get made, things that are being used, what the processes look like. We take compliance and uh, efficiency very seriously. And so we invest a lot of time and energy to make sure our facility is uh, top notch and, and compliant as well, which is really important. So we're really glad to have you and um, really glad that uh, you liked what you saw. It's, it's an interesting place. Oh, we love what we saw. And, you know, the other thing that I want to say is that, you know, people seem to be happy working for you guys. I mean, and that was, you know, well, like noted while we were walking around, um, you know, and I know and I told you this before, but I have to let everybody know that, you know, you have the president of this, this company walking around and people are just like, hey, Ira, and you're like, hey, John, hope you're having a nice day today or whatever it is that you said to them. And it's just to be able to see that, that you're actually addressing, you know, the employees by name really says something for you and says something for Keystone as well. Well, we care a lot about our employees. Uh, we focus a lot of time and attention on them. Frankly, like most businesses, you, you need good people and who are going to be loyal and committed to what you're doing. And a lot of that comes from the ownership team here and um, how they set the values. It's, you know, it is a family business. We're a big family business, but we're a family business. And so a lot of that um, kind of infiltrates uh, all parts of our business and the way we approach our employees. And uh, we do a lot to try and keep them safe, healthy, happy, and engaged in what we're doing. Well, you know, Keystone has been a leader of, since 1908 of innovating high-tech materials. So can you tell me a little bit about the history of Keystone and how you guys got started? I mean, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Um, some of our product lines have been around for over a century and still being used today. Things like uh, uh, Flex Cement um, products been around since the early 1900s, still being used today to bond in materials. And, um, you know, the current ownership of the business um, acquired National Keystone in early to mid 1970s. And over the last 50 years or so, has built this business by, uh, first of all, acquiring some smaller dental companies and filling out what the offering looks like, particularly focused at first on the laboratory space. And then as the business grew and um, our kind of core technical competency in polymers and denture polymers really evolved. Um, part of our company really started to focus on other polymer applications, cosmetic nail coatings being primarily amongst them. So at this time, you know, 30 years later, we're probably one of the two or three largest suppliers worldwide of UV curable materials for cosmetic nail coatings. Uh, we do a lot of business globally in that space. And um, so, you know, the dental business begat the cosmetic business. And then ultimately our cosmetic technologies making photopolymers for the nail application swung back and really became the backbone of our 3D printing business. Um, so um, Keystone over the 50 years of this company owning it, and frankly, the prior ownership has developed products, kept them compliant, have been state of the art from the time they were developed and then improved. And uh, we continue to devote a lot of time and attention to development, innovation. We have over 50 degreed scientists on staff. We invest well over 12 to 15% of our, um, our profits every year right back into R&D. 
Uh, it's a big focus of what we do, um, dental and cosmetic, and making products in a compliant way that are safe, that are going in or on the body. Uh, it's the lifeblood of our business. So not only do we have to know how to make these things at scale and ship them all over the world, but we have to make them in a way that are safe and effective uh, for the users. They're putting stuff in or on their body that we make, and we want to make sure that we are not only creating good products for the use, but that are safe and aren't going to cause any harm. Thank you for that. That's important. Absolutely. Uh, with 100 years in dental, what would you say was the first product that came into the industry? Well, for Keystone, um, I think early on, it was some of the, the cements and bonding agents. Mm -hmm. um, by the mid-70s, the company started to focus on some newer technologies. So, so at that point, thermal forming was just coming along. Company invested in purchasing uh, a leading thermal forming company. And mm -hmm. really, Proform became one of the leading brands for Keystone um, in the 70s and 80s, uh, whether it was mouth guards or night guards mm -hmm. or splint materials. And we still sell quite a bit of that material today. Uh, the brand is very strong. And then really um, into the early 2000s is where I think Keystone started to become mo more modern Keystone. We really started focusing on developing our products ourselves rather than purchasing companies and filling out our portfolio that way. And uh, with Diamond D, which is frankly one of the highest impact um, denture acrylics out there, it's tremendous materials, beautiful, very aesthetic. Um, we released that product in the early 2000s. I think 2003, we got our 510K on it. So it's been about 20 years. And from that point, I would say Keystone really started to focus on how do we develop products ourselves rather than just buying up technologies from other companies, mm -hmm. which we still do. You know, we, we're still looking for good acquisitions, but we also really started to focus on how do you innovate for yourself in key spaces. Excellent. And what would you say the latest innovation is? And how is it that you decide what you were going to put the time in for development? Well, that's a good question. Um, a, lot of qu a lot of ideas for product development come from a lot of different areas, whether it's sometimes it's customer driven. The customer comes to us and say, hey, we're looking for something like X and we can do it. We'll, and we think there's commercial value. We'll go in that direction. Sometimes it's you're just doing market studies and trying to figure out mm -hmm. where the future is heading. Uh, sometimes you see some things that the competitors are doing. And you go, oh, that's pretty interesting. I think we could probably do something like that. So ideas can come from a lot of different spaces. And then ultimately we like a lot of companies will vet them out in terms of what's the commercial opportunity? What's the market size? What's the current technologies? Why is this better? What's it going to take to perfect it and get it regulatory cleared? Who are going to be our partners? And so you, you work your way through all of those, those exercises, regardless of what the product is, and frankly, regardless of what the industry is. Mm -hmm. um, for us, um, the most innovative stuff we've worked on over the last six, seven years has been 3D printing materials. Um, digital dental technologies are, well, they're very much here now, but six or seven mm -hmm. years ago, they were, they were coming and it was a little early and we saw opportunity to make an impact in that space early by being able to be one of the first American companies, particularly in dental, to make um, resins for 3D printing for medical devices and being able to take advantage of our 30 years of history of making photopolymers for nails and having the equipment and the processes and the technical knowledge on how to do it and having the compliance pieces in place to make medical devices compliantly, we had a lot of what we needed to attack this aggressively and be a, really a, a leader in this space, be an early adopter. Uh, 2022, it's not so early anymore. Uh, we're still one of the leaders because we adopted early. Mm -hmm. uh, and we learned a lot on the way and, um, and have hopefully brought those learnings to our customers in the, in the form of really outstanding products that are open source and validated across, you know, 30, 40 different printing platforms. So for us, the most innovative and difficult thing we've done since I've been here has been the 3D project, but it's been totally worth it because um, while it's been hard and difficult right from the get-go, we had a lot of pieces in place that made it easier to do. I didn't have to figure out how to build a polymer manufacturing plant. I already had that. Already I didn't have to go, it. how do I get 13485 certified to make it compliantly? I already had that. Okay. So we had to figure out how to put the pieces together and come out with some really good products and really good branding. Um, and I think the most difficult thing we've done in that space is partnering really well with all the printer companies mm -hmm. who have their own agendas when it comes to resin, but we've been able to drive value to those partners to help us validate and such that 
you know, we're validated with every major 3D printing partner out there other than something like Formlabs, which the technology just doesn't match up as well with um, DLP and SLA. Mm -hmm. uh, we have found ways to work with almost every partner out there and do it in a way where we're not stepping on each other's toes and we're actually helping each other drive value and bring really innovative products and workflows. And that's important workflows right. to the marketplace, things that work together in a compliant and frankly, outstanding fashion. So um, our process of developing these resins and then figuring out how to partner and commercialize them in an open way uh, has been the most difficult and innovative thing I think we've done since we've been here, since I've been here. Excellent. That validation process, I mean, how does that actually work within, you have, you have a separate division that handles just the validation process of these resins with these different printers when it comes to 3D printing? Yeah, we have, we have some processes and resources dedicated only to that. Okay, so we probably have four people who are only working on validations, prints, test results, coordinating with the partners, coordinating with um, outside testing, doing mechanical testing, um, getting the biocompatibility reports. It's complicated. It is hard. Um, it is expensive. It is far and away the hardest thing Keystone does in the 3D space is taking the time, energy, and effort to make sure that regardless of what printer or post cure you are using, if you choose, for example, Keysplint Soft, your splint that you print in a Sega, on a Carbon, on a Nexa, on a Sprint Ray, we want it to be an apple to apple to apple comparison. The parts come out with the same physical properties profile, the same biocompatibility profile. Mm -hmm. That's hard because the equipment is different and this cure box is different and we really have to work full workflows. It is expensive and time consuming, but we put in the time, the energy, and the effort because it's absolutely critical to us to be able to look at our customers in the marketplace and say, here's everything we did to make sure you're going to have a safe and effective experience for your lab staff, for your doctors, and for your patients. It's Frankly, if we screw that up, we should be dead in the water, as should any company. You have to have really good, safe, effective products. And we put a lot of time and attention to it, particularly with the 3D printing, because the workflows are so critical. You need the printer and the resin and the cure box to be very much tied in to get those apple to apple to apple results. And we put in a lot of time, energy, and money to make that um, really one of the core principles of what we try to adhere to with it when it comes to our 3D printing materials. Excellent. We talked about having a partnership. Henry Schein has been, you know, a distribution partner of yours for many years um, with Henry Schein Dental, as well as Don Dental, which is the laboratory division of Henry Schein. How would you say that helped Keystone to get to where you are today? <laughs> uh, I laugh because um, Shine and Zahn have been um, really um, more than just you know distribution partners to Keystone. Uh, the companies have had a good close relationship for decades, long before I ever got to Keystone, and still have very good, strong relationships um, with uh, people inside Zahn, people inside his, of Henry Shine. Uh, we are. Um, uh, not only selling our Keystone products, we do a lot of private labeling, which we do some for, for, for those entities as well. That makes you a pretty special partner. And frankly, Keystone sold a business to Zahn about 10 years ago. We had a um, uh, kind of a competitive lab-based um, supply business directly to the marketplace, ultimately for a variety of reasons. Keystone decided that wasn't the best strategic fit, and we sold mm -hmm. Dental to Zahn. Um, that deepens the relationship. Um, being able to have really outstanding, frank, cooperative, collaborative discussions with folks like Rich Miranda and Rita Aquafridi over years allows not only trust, but goodwill to be developed and faith that you're delivering on what you promise. So um, we've worked very closely with those folks for a lot of years. We try and do special projects. You know, when we started with uh, Keyspoint Soft Clear and the carbon system, we worked exclusively with Zahn to distribute that product worldwide. Um, Keystone, um, it'd be a lot harder to do it without an outstanding partner like, like Zahn and Henry Schein. Um, they help us with our messaging. They help us provide a platform like today to get mm -hmm. some of our messaging and content out. Hopefully we deliver value and are an outstanding partner to those folks as well, both in terms of delivering uh, on time at, uh, at a right at the right price and products that are quality and there's no headaches coming working with Keystone hopefully 
you know, we're, we're pretty easy as a vendor partner. So, um, frankly, we would not be able to have grown to where we are today without, uh, without the folks, uh, at, at Henry Shine and Zon. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you. So that's for sure. And, and the whole Keystone team. Um, the other question that I want to ask you is what would something be that would drive a customer to choose a Keystone product over another product, let's say? Well, you know, there's a, there, that's a buying decisions and the psychology of the buyer. We could talk for hours about what makes people um, become brand lawyer loyal or product loyal or not. Okay. And it's hard. We spend a lot of time thinking about exactly that. How do you get people to feel loyal and to stick to your brand when there are some good products out there from competitive offerings? The pricing can be different. Um, if you have something that's commoditized, a lot of times you, you, you're coming down to price, right? If you have 10 options on something you want to buy, like a profi paste or a burr or whatever it may be, it's hard to convince the end user you have some real differentiating point. Um, uh, and a lot of it will come down to price or how you bundle products. So one of the things Keystone does is we have 5,000 plus SKUs. So we're able to offer a one-stop shop to customers so that it's easy to buy everything you want just from one place. But I think ultimately what it comes down to is, is having the right experience with your end users so that you have customers who ultimately become your cheerleaders, who become loyal to the product. It works. It works the way they need it to. Um, it fits well into their workflows and their practice, whether it's a doctor or a lab. And being able to leverage their positive experiences. So for us at Keystone, we spent a lot of time, I know I've mentioned it already once, spent a lot of time focusing on compliance and making sure that our products are coming to the market that are heavily tested, safe, and effective. Because as a manufacturer, you're dead in the water if you put out products and are you have a recall or you've hurt someone or it's not right. compliant or someone's having a massive leaking problem or whatever it is. It's a black eye and um, your distribution partners and your end user partners would be rightfully looking at you and going, well, what kind of stuff are we getting out of there? So for us, we view compliance as a very heavy competitive focus and advantage. When we can clear the barriers to entry with compliant manufacturing, with getting 510Ks on medical devices, whatever it may be where those barriers exist in either testing, cost, time, we want to clear those barriers. We want to clear them better than our competitors. And we want to be able to use that in a way that assures the consuming partners that the products they're using are going to do what we say they're going to do. They're going to be effective and there's not going to be any headaches with defective product, hurt patients, anything like that. And so for us, messaging that and pounding on it is one of the things we hope let people make a decision to choose Keystone product over something else they may have a choice to choose. It doesn't mean the other products aren't good and those competitors aren't doing a lot of the same things. I, I would be remiss if I left that impression. Mm -hmm. What I can tell you is I know what we're doing. <laughs> Okay. And I know we're doing a lot to try and cover those bases. I'm assuming my competitors are doing a lot of that too. I know a lot of them. I know they're doing some of it, mm -hmm. but I can only control what I can control. And so for, for, for me and for Keystone, we want to put out really good products and have very confident end users that, Hey, it does what it's going to supposed to do. It's priced right. It's a value add to my business. And um, now we see when we come out with new stuff, people are going to try our stuff now. They want to try it. They want to see what we have. Um, that's good that we've gotten to that place. It's a lot of work to get to that place. And they also want something that they can depend on, that the outcome is always going to be the same, the constant, you know, because like you talk, going into the human person, you know. We talk so. a lot here about uh, it's boring, you know, chemical manufacturer type language, but batch to batch consistency or variability is a thing. Mm -hmm. Like you, yeah. your batches, it doesn't matter when you made them, which operator made them, um, you want consistency batch to batch. And so, that, you know, it's not you easy. Hope that it's, it's a lot of work, work to get there. You know, you can't hope that it's going to work. It has to at it the end of the day. And yeah. with medical devices, like I said, you're out of business if, if you're not nailing those issues. So I, I don't know if you know that I am still a practicing um, hygienist. I practice, you know, very, inf I, I can't say infrequent, it's probably um, about eight hours a week. And I will tell you that in the short time that I practice weekly, I do see a lot of TMJ issues, a lot of wear, bruxism, 
you know, people are going through a lot of stress, especially, you know, during that time of the pandemic when there was so much uncertainty and people were worried constantly. So you can imagine like what was going on um, in their mind. I don't have to imagine. I've seen the data. All right. Exactly. The data says you, you've seen about a 60 to 65 increase in doctors reporting um, stress related tooth injuries, cracking, grinding during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of patients coming in hurting. I don't know why I'm hurting so much. I'm breaking teeth. Um, I can see, you know, where this is. Um, and I do, I do definitely prescribe mouth guards, night guards, mm -hmm. you know, very, very often in my short period of time that I'm practicing. So I can't imagine, honestly, and I, I should probably ask and see how many numbers I'm through my practices, but really how many are being prescribed out there and the amount of night guards that are being made and, and mouth guards that are being made now. Um, so I want to bring up, you know, definitely key splint soft and, and what is the difference between let's say key splint soft and maybe another material? Like what have you done differently to make it um, easier on the patient much, that they'll be able to wear it. You know, what, what kind of wear um, properties that you can be instilled into that particular product? Because, you know, I think it's a really good one, honestly. Yeah, we do too. Um, so uh, there was a lot in there. Let me unpack a little bit of it. Um, sure. First of all, uh, I think that night guards are underprescribed. Um, uh, whether you're suffering from TMJ, whether you're, you've got some nocturnal bruxism or daytime bruxism, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, whether you have an implant and it's made of zirconia or a crown that's made of zirconia and your opposing dentition is now at risk of losing the battle between <laughs> dentin and zirconia, um, night guards are really the best method to treat all of those. Um, some territories are much more proactive with night guard um, therapies. Europe's a very strong market. This country is getting better. Insurance reimbursements are also starting to shift that. So yes, you're seeing a lot of night guard usage, even though it's still probably under prescribed as a device and underutilized. Um, Key Splint Soft is without a doubt um, the most tested product that Keystone's ever put out. Okay. Between all the validation work we do and having to go to FDA with really what was the first um, flexible splint material for 3D printing. Um, a lot of time, effort, testing has gone into it. I think we've got now well over 250 passing cytotoxicity and biocompatibility checkpoints in various workflows with that product. With the amount we've sold, there's several million devices out in the field now. We have virtually no reports of breaks or damages. And when we do, it's usually was designed wrong or not cared for the right way. Mm -hmm. The product is outstanding. And it's, um, I love it because it's one of the products that frankly, everybody wins with, right? So the patient gets a great device. The doctor's getting a, um, a great fast device that has a lot of profit built into it. The labs are getting a great device that has good profit built into it. Keystone's making good money. The partners are thrilled. The distribution partners are thrilled. So it's a great product um, in terms of commercial success and delivering the therapies it needs to deliver. And really the way we did that was by creating a, the best product you could possibly, you could possibly come up with, in my opinion, okay? So that, look, we sell thermal form splint material. We sell a lot of it, actually. We still sell a lot of it. Um, but some of those technologies are gonna go away with 3D printing. So when we set out to create Key Splint Soft. We wanted to create something it was different and special. At the time we created it, the 3D printing resins that were on the market for splint applications were very rigid, very brittle, very susceptible to breaking, and not very well adopted. We had an uphill battle when we came up with Key Splint Soft. We basically had to re-educate everybody about what this product was and mm -hmm. um, get the stink of sort of the prior brittle products off of this new release. So we spent a lot of time getting cheerleaders on board early. But one of the first things we did, because we knew we were going to get questions of how long is this going to last in the body? How, yeah. how long is it going to hold up? And because we can't test it in the body until you get your 510K, we actually went through a very rigorous laboratory environment testing with uh, Creighton University um, to basically predictively show how Key Splint Soft would hold up over time with wear and impact resistance. And we compared it to probably seven or eight other traditional acrylic or thermal form materials, including our own, and mm -hmm. published it. 
And ultimately, um, that study proved out that this technology is not only adequate, but it's actually much better than the pre-existing technologies because between digital design, digital image capture, um, being able to store and save devices, um, you had a much more efficient workflow. You can push 10, 12 splints out in one work run, whereas if you're milling or using a traditional method, you can't get that possible amount of throughput. Price-wise, the device, by the time you build in labor, um, you know, you're getting maybe 85 splints out of a bottle of Keysplint Soft. Mm -hmm. A lab is probably making somewhere between six and $9,000 a profit with that, with that bottle. That's a lot of profit to leverage mm -hmm. into the lab. It's like printing money. So this product, it's better than traditional technologies because it's flexible. It lasts longer. It won't fracture. It won't break. And it's comfortable so that it doesn't hurt some of the really rigid splints, which by the way, I wear. I can't wear key splint hard. It's too hard on my teeth. I wear key splint soft. It's more comfortable for me. I know some mm -hmm. people like the harder. We make tools you choose. I prefer yeah. key splint soft. Um, and it, what it does is it allows better patient compliance. You're not taking it out and throwing it on the floor by the side of your bed every night because you're going, ow, it hurts, right? You're wearing yeah. it through the night. Those are all really important to have effective therapies. So that was a bit of a long answer about why Keith went soft and why, how we set out to do it and what we were trying to achieve and how we achieved it. We achieved it through some interesting chemistries. Um, but what we really set out was to solve some of the problems that ex existed with existing 3D printed splints to have something that could really be scalable, producible with high throughput and be of excellent quality. And we, and we, I'll say it, we nailed it. It's a great product. It's been the leader in the space. Now we have people coming in and trying to knock it off. And the old original, in my opinion, can't be beat. So um, we're very proud of that work. And we're very proud of the education we've done around it too. So even our competitors are coming out with their own sort of versions of Keystone Soft. They have the benefit of walking into a marketplace that's been heavily educated by Keystone about how these workflows work and how to work with this. We've done a ton of education around polishing. We put out um, written and video polishing instructions and a polishing kit. We put together a polishing kit. Go here. This is how you do it. We've set yeah. this up for the marketplace so they can go, it's really easy to use these products. The competitors are coming in now get the benefit that we've done a lot of this educational work to the marketplace. We'll continue to do that. Hopefully not for the benefit of our competitors, but because the end users, we want to help them be able to adopt these technologies eas easily and seamlessly. Um, whatever they ultimately use in 3D printing, it's good for everybody to adopt. It. So uh, we're trying to spend a lot of time on education as well to help the marketplace.